This is a documentary about a woman named Anita Sarkeesian, about her rise from obscure YouTube video game critic to internet ambassador to the UN Women's Coalition. This is a documentary about her lies and manipulations, about the damage she's done to video games, the damage she's done to women, and ultimately, the damage she's done to freedom of speech itself. But, this documentary also isn't about her. Not really. Anita Sarkeesian is just one face in the crowd. One of the more prominent faces, certainly, but she's not the leader by any means. Anybody could have filled her role, it just happened to be her. She was in the right place, at the right time, to take control of a cultural zeitgeist that was eager to attack a new, upstart industry, to dominate it and exploit it, to take over video games the same way they took over the film industry, the news media, and the school system. This story is nothing new, and she herself isn't that interesting. But she's part of an interesting phenomenon, and by telling her story, it will help us see that phenomenon for what it truly is. This is the story of how a YouTube nobody became a critical component in crafting the legislation that will be used to silence all dissenting voices on the internet and in the culture at large. This is Immersed in Subversion. In considering Sarkeesian's rise to power, it would be derelict not to start out by considering the video series which propelled her into the spotlight, her feminist frequency series, Tropes vs. Women. In this particular project, which I'm calling Tropes vs. Women in Video Games, I'm going to create a series of five videos that look at and deconstruct the most common and the most stereotypical representations of women in games. Despite only producing a handful of videos, averaging 20 minutes apiece, her critiques have provoked hours worth of disagreement from bloggers and YouTubers frustrated by what they would argue is a misrepresentation of video games. Both men and women have responded at length, demonstrating that her critiques have often ignored the context and the artistic intent of the game's creators. He's literally as stupid as saying games where you can fall to your death. You're actually being invited and encouraged to fall to your death. The male characters are just as sexually and physically objectified in video games as female characters. Built like Greek statues and chiseled to the core, dripping in sweat and blood and dirt, wielding a gun, muscles bulging and skin tight t-shirts. Yeah, great cosplay, that's all. Yeah, exactly. Well, the reason I ask is because when it comes to strong, confident, sexy female characters in gaming, there's quite a split with a feminist vote. And in the case of the intentionally hyper-sexualized character Bayonetta, one feminist's embodiment of female empowerment is another feminist's oppressed fuck toy worthy of sex shaming. These videos have disproved her claims in a multitude of ways, but there's a simpler way to break down her arguments. Identifying the four major categories of error that she repeatedly falls into. The outright lie, the lie by omission, manipulated evidence, and the double bind. Despite describing herself as both a researcher and a longtime gamer, Sarkeesian repeatedly brings up facts to support her arguments that are blatantly false. For instance, in her critique of this famous video game series, The Legend of Zelda was inspired by its creator Shigeru Miyamoto's memories of exploring streams and caves as a young boy growing up in Japan. Intent on finding misogyny in a man's memories of his youth, Sarkeesian said, Now I grew up on Nintendo. I've been a fan of the Mario and Zelda franchises for most of my life, and they'll always have a special place in my heart but it's still important to recognize and think critically about the more problematic aspects. It's disappointing that even with her moments of heroism, Zelda is still damseled. The damsel in distress is not just a synonym for weak. Instead, it works by ripping away the power from female characters. Distilled down to its essence, the plot device works by trading the disempowerment of female characters for the empowerment of male characters. Except, Zelda had already been the protagonist of her own game the appropriately titled Zelda's Adventure and Zelda, the Wand of Gamelon. When this was brought to her attention, Sarkeesian's producer, John McIntosh, responded by saying that these games didn't count because they were released on the CDI, a very unpopular game console. But this didn't stop her from using another CDI game, Hotel Mario, as an example in her video Women as Background Decoration. Ha <laughs> ha! Here's the problem. Too many toasters! You know what they say, all toasters toast toast. 
Then there is the case of Bayonetta, whom she describes as the overly sexualized adolescent male fantasy that which might seem accurate upon first viewing until you realize that the character was designed by Mary Shimazaki, a woman. Rather than a male fantasy, Bayonetta is the realization of a female fantasy, the exact same fantasy which sells fashion magazines and has popularized pole dancing as a means of physical fitness. The power of looking sexy! But admitting that some women enjoy looking attractive doesn't fit with Sarkeesian's narrative, so the designer's sex is never mentioned if she even knew it in the first place. Time and again, Sarkeesian outright lies about the video game she's critiquing. She's either an incompetent researcher or a biased ideologue. 2. The Lie by Omission Despite promising an in-depth examination of how tropes in video games depict women, Sarkeesian will often omit crucial details which are needed to understand the context of the events she criticizes. In discussing the supposed dehumanization of female characters, she says, Their status as disposable objects is reinforced by the fact that in most games, discarded bodies will simply vanish into thin air a short time after being killed. To a non-gaming audience, this sounds outright sinister. But the reality is nothing of the sort. The dead bodies disappear simply to save on memory. It happens to both sexes, as well as to any other items which are left lying around. Her implication that this is a deliberate choice by the developers only serves to mislead the non-gaming public. Later in the same video, she plays a clip from Fallout New Vegas where she shows the consequences of killing one of the in-game characters. Without proper context, the viewer is left with the impression that Fallout must be a game where murdering women is lighthearted fun. On the contrary, what you're witnessing is the result of a simplified morality meter, meant to simulate the public's perception of you in a rough-and-tumble frontier world. Commit crimes, and you will be hated. Perform good deeds, and you will be loved. Save the entire town, and then get into a drunken knife fight. You'll be a good-natured rascal. All that this clip truly demonstrates is that morality meters can be broken by the player if you go out of your way to do so. This sort of manipulated, cherry-picked data allows her to construct any argument she wants, regardless of what's actually occurring in gaming. Number 3. Manipulated Evidence While the previous fallacies could be attributed to incompetence or an emotional reaction to adult content, the manipulated evidence category shows that Sarkeesian is deliberately using the open world of video games to construct a predetermined narrative. Unlike movies, books, or TV, video games are designed to be an interactive medium, where the player's input is needed to help the story progress. They try and simulate reality as realistically as they can, but no game is going to be as creative as a player when he or she attempts to break the game. In other words, it is always possible for a player to go off script and create farcical results. Sarkeesian takes advantage of this to create macabre tableaus and then blames them on gamers and developers. The player cannot help but treat these female bodies as things to be acted upon. While playing Hitman Absolution, a game where you play as an assassin who's supposed to take out his target and get away unseen, she ignores her mission and risks capture by breaking into the women's dressing room, murdering the women there, and then dragging their bodies around. ...of sexual arousal connected to the act of controlling and punishing representations of female sexuality. Games, by their very nature, allow a breadth of activity, far beyond what is intended by the narrative. You can play a racing game and crash into other players for fun. This doesn't mean that the game is teaching poor driving habits. The open-world games which Sarkeesian seems to prefer allow you to commit mass murder simply because that is the nature of the game engine. Sarkeesian attributes psychosexual motives to all of this and shows the bloodiest clips she can find, pretending that this is the primary reason gamers enjoy video games. It's so that they can abuse women. Not the challenge, not the adventure, not the catharsis of being immersed in a great narrative, but because of their hatred for women. Number 4. The Double Bind This is where it becomes clear that Sarkeesian doesn't approach gaming with an objective standard. She approaches it with a presumption of sexism. Game developers are damned if they do, and damned if they don't. 
Despite previously complaining about the lack of female protagonists in video games, the good news is that there's nothing stopping developers from evolving their gender representations and making more women heroes in their future games. It'd be great to finally see Zelda, Sheik, and Tetra as the protagonists of their own games. When she does find a female protagonist who is strong, heroic, and equal to any male protagonist, she still finds them wanting. So finally, after being kidnapped in 13 separate Super Mario games, Peach gets to be the hero for once. But don't get too excited, because everything else about the game ends up in a train wreck of gendered stereotypes. Furthermore, the fact that the female characters are made to look female, with pink dresses and bows, a design choice by artists to quickly communicate information to the player, she continues to complain. How do we know what gender a particular character is? Other than their names, how do we know that the collection of pixels on the right signal male, while those on the left indicate female? The Bubble Bobble series stars heroes Bub and Bob, who are charged with rescuing their female counterparts and respective love interests Peb and Pab. Lala is a feminized version of the male hero Lolo in the Adventures of Lolo series. Mimi fills this role as the main protagonist's girlfriend in the Super Monkey Ball games. In Disney's popular Where's My Water mobile games, we know that Allie is female because she's the only alligator who wears a bow. It's clear that Sarkeesian's videos were never meant to critique games in the first place. Between the lies and the shifting goalposts, there's no coherent critique to be found. The only consistency is her characterization of games and gamers as prurient, puerile, juvenile losers who are probably violent sex criminals in the making. Her career as a video game critic should have been short, bad, and ultimately forgotten. But there was something else that would keep Anita in the spotlight, ultimately giving her positions of influence and power over games and society. They call themselves the social justice warriors. Lobbyists, journalists, and power brokers who demand the right to police language and enforce equality, without regard for the damage it does to the games, to the industry, or to the many women already employed therein. Enter Sarkeesian, an attractive, well-spoken woman with a commitment to radical feminism and a body of work decrying that upstart gaming industry. She was exactly what they were looking for. In 1971, a community organizer by the name of Saul Alinsky published a book titled Rules for Radicals. In it, he laid out the strategies by which political radicals could bait, subvert, and seize control of the establishment. His work has been criticized as a handbook for achieving political power without taking any responsibility. Alinsky advocated riling up emotions in one's followers, offering deceptively simple solutions to complex problems, attacking individuals rather than ideas, and creating a mob to force the establishment into negotiation. Rules for Radicals is the handbook for the present-day social justice movement. A prominent member and personal friend of Anita Sarkeesian, film reviewer Movie Bob Chipman, is noted to have said, there are no bad tactics, just bad targets. It is a philosophy that isn't tempered by ethics or restraint, any and all action is acceptable if they consider you an enemy. And yet, a veneer of goodness is necessary. As Alinsky said, all effective actions require the passport of morality. In the case of social justice, they claim to represent the underprivileged in our society. Women, ethnic minorities, and transsexuals are prominent avatars for their cause. Opposing social justice is equated to hatred. But is that truly the case? Do social justice warriors, as they call themselves, truly represent all women, all blacks, all minorities in a perpetual war against the patriarchal establishment? Or do they use these groups as a shield, as a passport of morality, to cover up their own blind lust for power? But you need to go. You need to go. You need to go. Sir, please respect these people. Christina Pereira is a PhD student at University of Nevada. She has a master's in clinical psychology and is a member of the sociology department. Her current research focuses on body labor and the experiences of sex workers in Nevada brothels. Because of this, she has often found herself clashing with radical feminism. Feminists of the school to which Sarkeesian belongs have often claimed to speak for all women, 
but as Miss Pereira was about to tell us, they certainly don't speak for her. When the, when the economic need arose mm -hmm. and one of my friends told me, have you heard about webcamming? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, what is that? And, uh, you know, within a couple of weeks, I was on a webcam making money and then my world changed. Through being in the sex industry, I got more interested in studying it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the two now go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. You know, I identify as an activist for sex worker rights. I'm studying the industry and hoping to put my findings out there. Mm -hmm. And then I'm still working as a sex worker. Mm -hmm. So these are things that are very near and dear to me in many facets of my life. Part of being a sex worker rights and a porn activist, yeah. uh, or advocate rather, is about um, protecting mm -hmm. freedom of speech. And uh, to me, women like Gail Dines and Anita Sarkeesian are against freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. And I believe that they would want to see censorship and, and just look at her followers, mm -hmm. you know, as you call them the, so the social justice warriors. Yeah. Their point is always right, mm -hmm. you know, and it should be heard. Yeah. But if you're a dissenter, if you go against them, forget mm -hmm. it. You need to be silenced. Yeah. And it's the same tactics being used in both, um, you know, radical feminism yeah. and that discourse. And right now, what I, if, at least what I can tell and what I understand of mm -hmm. the whole gaming, uh, yeah. this issue now in gaming. Sure. I see the treatment of sex workers from Gail Dines mm -hmm. and Melissa Farley and all the rest of them as very similar to the way that Anita treats the char the female characters. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? How are we going to tie this porn monster down step by step? We're going to use the Gulliver strategy. Education by education by education. Feminist Frequency videos have been used in middle school, high school, and university classrooms. They've been integrated into the curriculum of media studies, gender studies, and law school programs. Well, the argument is the same. You know, the argument that Gail Dines, for example, makes about porn and the pornified nation and, you know, all these poor victims, these exploited women. Mm -hmm. um, it's the same argument, from what I can tell, that Anita has about the characters in the games. So the way I see it, it's like an analogy. The characters in the games are kind of like the porn stars, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, women like Gail Dines, uh, feminists like Gail Dines, the way they speak about porn stars and porn performers, I think, is what really objectifies them mm -hmm. because it turns them into nameless, faceless mm -hmm. objects that yeah. she is speaking for and speaking about. Yeah. And, and if they try to turn around, and I've seen this on Twitter and, mm -hmm. and with protests, and say, no, you're wrong about us and hear my truth, she just says, well, you have a false consciousness. Commercials targeted at girls heavily focus on teaching child rearing, homemaking, domestic work, popularity, self-image, and an obsession with beauty. This restricts their imagination of what women are capable of and prioritizes appearances over intelligence. Now, what happens to young girls is when they are developing their sexual identity, what they learn is they have two choices, either fuckability or invisibility. Gail Dines is a professor of women's studies at Boston's Wheelock College, who has been waging an anti-porn crusade since the mid-80s. She is open about her desires for censorship, describing pornography as a public health issue so as to justify laws governing what sorts of pictures and videos adults are allowed to purchase. One topic that continually crops up in her lectures, as well as those of Anita Sarkeesian, is education. They start with the assumption that all behavior is learned, and that the path to utopia is re-education. Control the media, control the schools, control all of the information people are allowed to consume, and they'll be able to put an end to violence, misogyny, and inequality. Anybody who disagrees with them, whether it's women in the gaming industry or sex workers who enjoy their profession, is said to have false consciousness. So false consciousness is uh, it's a Marxist theory and basically it says that the people have been dulled and dumbed into submission, the workers, you know, the proletariat, and they they think that they're happy or you know they're just not aware. They haven't had their consciousness raised yet. So they're under this false consciousness because they have yet to embrace um, you know, the Marxist principles that would essentially save them from that, which is exactly what we see now in feminism. You know, it's, uh, I'm a tool of the patriarchy, you know, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a sex worker and I choose to be, but no, 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 
I really am just a tool of the patriarchy and I have no idea and I've been brainwashed. Yeah. So that's what false consciousness means. Of course, the social justice movement doesn't restrict their advocacy to just feminism. They've recently coined the term intersectionality to describe their obsession with race, class, sexual orientation, and any other criteria they can use to label people. It's a term that Jason Miller is all too familiar with. Miller is a game developer from Detroit and a prominent member of 2014's consumer revolt known as Gamergate. He started the Twitter hashtag NotYourShield as a protest against this intersectionality. He argues that people can speak for themselves. There's this thing called Gamergate, and it's about ethics and games journalism. Some people are trying to steer the topic towards identity politics, and I created a hashtag for people that were actually concerned about games journalism called not your shield. And that's for all the minorities, women, people of all different backgrounds that these people are claiming to represent to kind of say, hey, we actually do care about the ethics and games journalism thing here. Let's talk about that a bit. That's what Not Your Shield is really all about. It's about all these people speaking for themselves. Like sometimes from the um, social justice work community, I mean, I've gotten questions like, well, so and so happened. This person disagreed with this person about trans policy or whatever, why didn't you step in? I said, well, because I allow everybody to speak for themselves. I have that belief that every human being can speak for themselves and their experiences. I cannot speak for a trans person better than a trans person can speak for themselves. I interacted with feminists that they couldn't understand. They literally could not put it together how a PhD candidate could be a prostitute, could be a wife, mm -hmm. could be an intelligent woman, mm -hmm. you know, and could own a dog and, a, and an apartment and have a normal life, yeah. you know, um, because I wasn't sitting on the street with a needle hanging out of my yeah. arm. And to me, that's, that's ridiculous. Every debate I enter into, I consider that I could be entirely wrong. I don't possess 100% of the information on this subject. I enter, I enter debates to understand other people's views and share those, kind of like a free marketplace of ideas, you know. There's a lot of this stuff going on in academia, and apparently this is after my years of being in school where they're teaching this kind of social justice nonsense, you know, minorities can't be racist and all this stuff. And they're, re they're really buying into it hard. And the thing is, they buy into it so hard in academia where there aren't those actual kind of people. And when they meet an actual African-American, it's like, no, I think this is horse shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's false consciousness. You've just been brainwashed into... Exactly, it's um, what they call internalized massage, internalized racism. The Honey Badger Brigade is a collection of artists and social commentators who are strong believers in the free marketplace of ideas. As an all-female group, they are intimately familiar with the sorts of unscrupulous behavior certain women will use to gain a leg up over others. They find it ironic that Anita Sarkeesian will complain about the damsel in distress trope while simultaneously playing the role of damsel on the public stage. It's been their experience that women like her wind up damaging the reputation of all women, especially those who genuinely want to participate in video game culture, engineering, or any other male-dominated field. They've taken it upon themselves to call out this sort of manipulative behavior wherever they find it. What's frustrating is that, is that the charge of misogyny is, is an excellent, very effective silencing tactic. Mm -hmm. And if our culture was misogynistic, pervasively and systemically misogynistic, it would not work at all. This is evidence of misogyny. No, that's evidence of the internet, the way people are on the internet the moment they understand that nobody can hold them accountable for certain things that they do. When they realize that they're invisible, they, uh, <laughs> they'll they be willing to all kinds of, yeah, yeah. they'll feel invincible so they'll say things <laughs> and do things that they normally wouldn't do. She sat there and called men toxic. Mm -hmm. She, you know, she got some anger back from people over yeah. that. You know, and they called her some nasty names too. And, well, you know, you sit around and tell men that they're the scum of the earth. They're going to tell you that the, you're the scum of the earth too. And, you know, people use rough language when they're mad. Yeah. So she whined about it and she damseled about it. And and got you know, and then she linked her blog post. Then she, she linked, linked her Patreon. Patreon. The term damsel in distress is a translation of the French demoiselle en détresse, 
As a trope, the damsel in distress is a plot device in which a female character is placed in a perilous situation from which she cannot escape on her own and must be rescued by a male character, usually providing the core incentive or motivation for the protagonist's quest. And what has she done, right? I get rape threats from these gamers, right? They're the bad guys. And then what is what what do the players in the media do, right? In the mainstream media, they say she's just identified the bad guy because they're being mean to her. So we're going to go after them and we're going to leap just like tropes do. They take you from A to Z in one nanosecond, right? You don't have to link any of the lead. No fact finding required, mm -hmm. right? It's an emotional punch. It's, it's a shortcut that that's all you need to know. Because you just know it's wrong. And she uses that every time she highlights one of these threats and the media goes after and, and attacks gamers as being the source of these threats. Um, then she's, she's manipulating, she's exploiting that trope. The tropes exist for a reason. They exist for a reason because they work. They work because they've been with us for so long. Right? They've been with us for so long that we don't have to think about them. You see a man kicking a dog, he's an asshole. You see a man beating a woman, he's a douchebag. Right? Or worse. And, I mean, this is just, they're just instant judgments that we make. Yeah. Right? And if we were a misogynistic society, they would not be effective. It's not just a matter of the social justice movement using women and minorities as a shield to justify their behavior. They also need a scapegoat. And according to them, the most wicked intersection of intersectionality is where white, straight, and male all come together. These are the head offices of the patriarchal conspiracy theory. One of the people who resides at this corner is Paul Elam, founder of the website A Voice for Men. Passionate in his beliefs, but moderate in his views, he spearheads the men's human rights movement. He defends those who've been unjustly accused under the Violence Against Women Act. He advocates for equality between the sexes and equity in divorce courts. To any sensible person, he might be mistaken for a feminist. But it's been the feminists and their social justice allies who have been the most vicious in their attacks on him, both online and in the mainstream media. No matter how much evidence, no matter how many studies he collects, they will not listen to reason. I've encountered a lot of controversy. I've encountered death threats. I've encountered uh, all kinds of opposition. I've encountered multiple hit pieces from the mainstream media who seek to demonize my work. And mainly it's because it, we are take a stand against the feminist narrative. We think that uh, feminists got it wrong uh, in many ways and that there needs to be corrections to that. Um, unfortunately, it's not very popular with the mainstream media and certainly not very popular with social justice warriors. There's a Tumblr blog called mm -hmm. Sir, You Are Being Mocked. Yeah. And he amassed a <laughs> list this long of links to female mass shooters, uh, women who kill men who, who reject their sexual advances, mm -hmm. women who kill men who reject their romantic overtures, women who kill men, you know, out of spite after being broken up with, you know, it's like we're, we have been trained to look at this as a male phenomenon. It is not a male phenomenon. A black female from an upper middle class neighborhood on the east coast of the United States is still considered oppressed even though maybe her father was a federal judge and she's been to Yale Law School, uh, she's a member of two oppressed classes, being female and being African-American. Her life doesn't exhibit that at all. There's power in being a victim. There absolutely is. Well, unless you're a white male, um, or uh, in, in many cases, unless you're a black male, um, there is absolute power in getting the sympathies of the public, which mainly fall along the lines of sympathies for women's struggles. It's one of the issues we deal with at A Voice for Men is that we know from all the scientific research that's available that there is relative gender symmetry in the incidence of domestic abuse. We know that women hit men, men hit women. We also know that children are the most affected. Insults, death threats, 
and reputations being attacked, the very things the social justice movement accuses their enemies of doing. With one important difference. When they claim harassment, the donations pour in. When they receive anonymous internet death threats, they're provided with police protection. When they have their reputations questioned, and with them it's almost always the case that some sort of ethical violation has been exposed, another company full of fellow travelers is more than happy to hire them on, if they even get fired in the first place. Internet harassment can be big business, if you're the right sort of person. If you oppose the social justice movement, however, it's not some cathedral of misogyny or racism that kept me from making games and participating in gaming culture. It's these social justice worries that have that when I just said, hey, let's take a minute and actually talk about the issue here, they took every swing in the world they could at me. There's a laundry list by now. I mean, everything from um, there's been fake suicide reports filed to um, police have been called to my work has been called, my family's been called, I've been called. I don't even keep a phone now because, I mean, at this point, when everybody knew the number, what's the point? The tactics they use right now, like going for people's jobs and sniffing out information on them and all that, those are the same tactics the Klan used back in 1955. The same thing happened to Allison of the Honey Badger Brigade for daring to question her social betters. On April 17, 2015, I was ejected by security from the Calgary Comics and Entertainment Expo. I was not just ejected, but banned for life from all of the events the organizers put on across Canada. I was ejected for allegedly harassing panelists at a panel where they brought up the topic of men's rights and I politely requested to speak to that topic and was granted permission. I spoke out against being seen as a victim because I am a woman and I was banned. Why is a woman rejecting victimhood so threatening? Because you need a damsel to have a villain. And having a villain justifies every act of war, every act of lynching, genocide, marginalization, bigotry, and hatred throughout history. This is the narrative that builds empires and controls populations and justifies persecution. This is the narrative that silences inconvenient truths. This is the narrative that is silencing the men and women of Gamergate, and this is the narrative that is silencing my friends. I will not stand for that. From day one of her feminist frequency campaign, there's been a figure who Sarkeesian keeps being compared to. Ten years ago, instead of video games causing sexism, they were blamed for causing violence. Claims which Sarkeesian herself has echoed on social media. It was a lawyer from Florida who became the figurehead for the media's attack on video games. He was the supposed enemy of the gaming industry, against which all gamers were united. We spoke to him to find out what his stance actually was, and to find out what he thought about Anita Sarkeesian. Well, let me say that if I were the Jack Thompson described at Wikipedia, or certain gaming sites, I probably would have killed myself a long time ago. Uh, uh, which made it might have been construed to be urban renewal, but <laughs> but um, what I did as an attorney when I was still an attorney was to forge a civil uh, litigative remedy for this problem that we're talking about, and that is the sale of adult mm -hmm. or mature rated entertainment products to kids. Sure. The question is, am I in favor of censorship? Do I want to limit the First Amendment? No, mm -hmm. I do not. The, 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 the bright red line for me has always been in that adult entertainment should be available to adults. Mm -hmm. Under the First Amendment, they can get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But because young brains mm -hmm are literally different structurally and functionally than adult brains. There is a neurobiological basis for my concern. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the satire that's evident in Grand Theft Auto, 13-year-olds mm -hmm. don't really get satire. Mm -hmm. They get the violence. So that brings us um, wonderfully into the primary crux of the documentary, which is going to be the recent 
controversy surrounding Anita Sarkeesian. Well, uh, based on what I've seen that she's done, um, uh, she has she's very free with her opinions and doesn't seem to have a lot of evidence. She's, she's got feelings about, about this. And I mean, the death threats, frankly, uh, I've seen her using as sort of a self-promotion yeah. thing, which kind of bugs me. She's kind of a hypocrite in that she's a feminist, but she's claiming, I think you can see in some of her emphases that she should be treated a little special. Yeah. yeah. So you got to make up your mind. What, what sets Anita Sarkeesian apart is she's actually, before with Jack Thompson and all the video games cause violence things, it, it was always the, the game industry was a united front against, you know, uh, Jack Thompson and those people, the censors and all of that. They were a united front. Now the industry is very sharply divided. She has come at it not from the angle of video games cause violence, but video games cause sexism. You know what she is? She's a colonist. A colonist. And a cultural appropriator and an infiltrator. Mm -hmm. She's trying to claim something that's not hers as hers. What is Gamergate? By the early 2000s, the battle of gamers versus Jack Thompson had more or less been resolved when retailers agreed to start enforcing the ESRB rating system. While there was still the occasional skirmish and misrepresentation in the media, gaming entered a golden age, exploring new technologies, writing more in-depth narratives, and blossoming into an industry worth $100 billion, a number on par with films and television. But by mid-2014, gamers were beginning to sense a disturbance in the force. Instead of the purity of creative spark meets financial investment, they were increasingly seeing games that seemed to be agenda-driven, such as the previous summer's Gone Home, a walking simulator with poor graphics and no gameplay to speak of, where you walk around an empty house finding notes left by your sister, a lesbian who just defected from the military to run off with her lover. By the way, that's not the premise, that's the entire plot. Despite this, it received rave reviews in the gaming media. Simultaneously, there was a growing push to end harassment in multiplayer games, which was dividing the community. While nobody wants to hear a 12-year-old yell slurs about other people's mothers, aggressive first-person shooters do tend to engender language that's more appropriate for a locker room than a Japanese tea ceremony. While the gaming media was calling upon publishers to police their environments with an iron fist, most gamers preferred that this be settled on a case-by-case -case basis. All of this came to a head in August when Iran Joni, the boyfriend of a game developer named Zoe Quinn, the auteur behind a game called Depression Quest, exposed her infidelity with at least five other men, all of whom worked in the gaming industry and the gaming press, many of whom had promoted her work after they slept with her. Gamers revolted, demanding that ethics be returned to gaming journalism and that these obvious ideologues be rousted. Sleeping with game reviewers for positive coverage was unacceptable. Granting awards to substandard games because the developer was a transsexual or the protagonist was a minority was corrupt. As the months went on, more scandals unfolded. Nepotistic groups of far-left social justice warriors whose work was amateurish or non-existent promoting one another and rigging contests. Meanwhile, the gaming media declared that gamers were dead and that the calls for ethics in games journalism were nothing but a cover for misogyny. Adam Baldwin dubbed the movement Gamergate. You? Yeah. If you tell anyone, I'm gonna force feed you your spleen through your nose. A revolt against those entryists who only became interested in gaming after it became financially successful. Since then, most of the agros, as the anti-gamergators are called, have ceased developing games entirely and have instead become professional victims, or political lobbyists. Do you remember that picture from the UN? Yep, that blue-haired woman sitting next to Anita Sarkeesian is Zoe Quinn herself, ex-developer of, quote, goofy video games about feelings and farts. One of the misconceptions that I've seen from the outside 
is that people think that there's a male game developer culture and a female game developer culture, and there isn't. There's just a development culture. Here, for example, we've hired a lot of female developers. Our best known games are were programmed primarily by women, and we didn't hire them looking for women. We hired people based on their qualifications, and they happen to be women. And mm -hmm. if you want to talk clicks, it's not based on gender; it's based on role. Mm -hmm. Like, and anyone who's ever been in a game studio knows exactly. I want to look right in the camera and say, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Artists, right, and developers, and they're ah, and of course they're mutual enemy the sales guys and the marketing guys, right? And they, they that's, that's the kind of culture. That's not ba these people who try to b draw these artificial distinctions based on sex have clearly never been in, in a game studio. Because this is the case everywhere. Artists versus developers is like an in industry meme. <laughs> and it's the same thing with these people who criticize video games. They don't program. They don't even play the fucking games. They merely want to be a Monday morning quarterback, uh, armchair quarterback, and criticize. And then on top of it, get paid for it. And as per usual with these, you know, you get a 3.5 or you're egotistical and maniacal. You don't care about fellow human beings. You don't care about the Haitians. It's all about you. It's all about your ego. You will put some kind of crusade in front of it just so you can get attention. It's always, uh, always about money and ideology. I think. Money first, ideology a close second in some cases. Gamergate's another example of that. The, uh, the social justice warriors have moved in and they want to alter the entire gaming community uh, and change what it means to be a gamer. And they're doing this by attacking the games themselves. They're actually attacking products that are being made that are, that are profitable because men and women want to buy them and trying to insert a narrative that they believe in and turn out shitty games that won't sell. Entryism is a political strategy where a small political organization will urge its members to join another larger organization for the sake of subverting its purpose and expanding their power. It's a duplicitous tactic used by those who have a false narrative, a hidden agenda, and who aren't interested in arguing in the marketplace of ideas. It is a strategy as old as humanity itself, but the style of entryism that we see in the modern world derives from Leon Trotsky's 1934 essay, The French Turn. He argued that the members of the French Communist League should abandon it to join the French section of the Workers' International. Over the long run, this would destroy the latter organization, but this was irrelevant to Trotsky. Communism, at any cost, was his motto, even if that meant spreading like an infectious disease, infecting and ultimately killing the host before moving on to new grounds. The great push in recent decades has been for radicals to take over the information organs of society. By controlling the information that's available, they can control the narrative, the conception of the world which guides people's actions. The development of the internet is a threat to all of this. Its decentralization allows too many competing facts, too many uncomfortable truths to come to the surface. This is why they've begun organizing to take over the major internet organs such as Twitter, YouTube, and Wikipedia. This is, the, this is the group that's protecting the social justice warriors that have the influence over the government through lobbying and through various other ways. And they're in position, positions of influence in academia, they're in positions of influence in government. You know, it, it's, and then the media that protects their interests and their image and you know american thought particularly staying within their framework that's not mainstream the the mainstream of the american public is not like that that's establishment media oftentimes the issue is that the journalist has an issue that they want to propagate right they and rather and what they do is they go out and they find we saw this most recently in the Virginia uh, yes. Tech thing, right? Yeah. She already had a story. She was looking for stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, they're, they're say it's yellow journalism. It's like we're going to sacrifice long-term credibility, loyalty, and true journalism, like reporting the facts, for sensationalism, for ratings now, for the short-term American attention span to get the ratings, get the money, get the, the proceeds and the advertising revenues. And we, I mean, there, you, you can't even say there's journalism at all in the United States anymore. 
it's really a short term tell people you know ferguson's a perfect example forget that uh rioting and and there's death and or, no the american or not the american but the american uh media they don't care how many people they kill as long as we can churn it up and and, and get race relations really hating let's get the blacks to hate the whites and the whites to hate the blacks let's make it like an, you know, a firestorm create all the drama <clears throat> that's money for them today and now Forget it if down the road that means the United States collapse, there's a civil war, a race war, whatever else. They don't care about that. They, they, they don't have the moral capacity, let alone the long-term thinking uh, or, or delayed gratification to think about that. Alex Hinckley, a game developer and regular Wikipedia contributor, ran into this firsthand when he discovered that Anita Sarkeesian had a professional relationship with a couple of men by the names of Alex Mendozian and Bart Baggett both of whom have ties to pickup artistry. Hi, my name is Anita Sarkeesian. I'm from Los Angeles, California, and my website is neonicchrome.com. And I just want to let you all know how amazing Alex's Teleseminar Secrets was. It really motivated me to get my own business started. In a preview call, what's critical to include and exclude to maintain value but not give away too much? The answer is cognitive dissonance. Let me repeat that. Cognitive dissonance. While there is nothing wrong with learning how to flirt successfully with women, and these days Baggett is a court-recognized handwriting expert, not a pickup artist, these are odd credentials for someone who has become the face of feminism, who has stated that we must listen and believe all claims made by women against men. One of the most radical things you can do is to actually believe women when they tell you about their experiences. Thank you. When Alex brought this to Wikipedia's attention, he ran into a member of the subversive cabal firsthand. Well, I had become aware online after seeing some videos that she had uh, previously worked with a man named Bart Baggett. Mm -hmm. And Bart Baggett was listed on a pickup artist directory for his work um, writing a book about I guess pickup artistry, <laughs> I guess that's what you'd call it. The reason that she's been so successful is because of her work history and training with Alex Mendozian as a teleseminar expert and with working with Bart Baggett as an NLP expert because it gives her a sense of being able to manipulate what people believe mm -hmm. and what people think. So she's able to portray herself in the way that she wants to be portrayed and that helps further her own goals. Mm -hmm. So after that, I went on to her Wikipedia article, mm -hmm. and anybody can edit Wikipedia, but I've actually been an editor there since 2006, mm -hmm. so I've had a long history of editing. I, I had over a thousand articles edited, mm -hmm. and I was reading through her article, and I saw no mention of this, and I thought it was pretty important because why would uh, the face of feminism mm -hmm. have previously worked with someone who's, who was a pickup artist or is a pickup artist? It seems mm -hmm. like a contradiction. Yeah. So what I did was I knew that there was a lot of controversy surrounding her, mm -hmm. so I didn't want to edit the article just flat out. So I went onto her talk page and I made an edit there asking if perhaps this should be included in the article. And then I cited the, a source, which was her own, an archived version of her own website. Mm -hmm. Another editor had come along almost instantaneously, so it must have been on his watch list, mm -hmm. and he edited out my comments, he edited Bart Baggett's name out and he edited the sources out. And then almost comically, he replied to my comment saying, you need to cite your sources. Ian Fleming, author of the James Bond novels, once wrote, once is an accident, twice is coincidence, three times is an enemy action. Did Alex just run into a single bad apple, a zealous adherent of Miss Sarkeesian's radical views? Or was there something more at work? In September of 2014, during the initial swell of the Gamergate consumer revolt, Breitbart journalist Milo Ianopoulos exposed a secret group of over 150 gaming journalists organizing behind the scenes. They would discuss ways of promoting radical agendas that neither gamers nor game developers were interested in exploring, and in fact even looked at ways to undermine the funding of this very documentary. That journalists should have a relationship with their subject matter is only natural. Auto magazines are on friendly terms with car companies. Political writers are often friends with politicians. But this was more than just a friendly relationship. 
Milo's expose showed Game Journal Pros to be a deeply biased organization with a distinct agenda. They would go out of their way to cover up unethical behavior of their political allies while using unethical tactics against their political opponents. No one cared until the August 28th or whatever deluge of articles that were clearly put together by a, I won't say conspiracy, but collusion. I, I, yeah, collusion on this. And then when they, right after they put that, I had made a blog uh, about this saying, guys, can be careful about those mailing lists of yours because you're going to get out there someday. <laughs> and, and like, I, when that came out, it's like, oh God, they're, they're, this, is, this, is, this is not a good thing. Because mm -hmm. rather than take a, a nothing, yeah. which was, I know this is going to, this will probably get you, gamer gate people unhappy with me, but mm -hmm. we didn't care. Yeah. We don't care about the indie market. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, we don't care about the, the indie scene. Yeah. There, it's, it's basically just this noise. Mm -hmm. and not to sound snobby, but we don't care about it. Yeah. What we did care, though, is a lot about is like, Wait a minute. Rather, rather than just ignoring it or going, well, we probably shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. You're going to actually accuse that the motivations of not just those gamers, but basically gamers in general, the people who buy our products and the people you're covering, are misogynists. Yeah, that's insane. I no longer am going to listen to a person who writes going through their brain and filters the information before they present it. I don't want any. I don't want any opinion from anybody anymore because, frankly, if you look at journalists, people who go into journalism, they're politically motivated. They're not, they're not morally motivated. They're not like, I want to become a journalist because I really care about the truth and want to be the fourth branch of government and keep tyranny at bay. They're like, I want to go change the world. I don't like math. I think it's romantic and eccentric to become a journalist, and I want to become something popular and famous. I want to, basically, I'm too lazy and I want to avoid math, but I want to be fam you know, famous and popular. I think journalism, no, journalism majors today are fucking, they're fucking hacks. They're, 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 the only people you, would sh you should trust less than journalism majors would be the political science majors who think that they're going to become the fucking leaders of the world at the age of 17 when they declare their major. It's amazing they happen to discover misogyny as being a serious issue on the same day as people began to question ethics and journalism. What, yeah. what an amazing coincidence. Let's be very clear. The mainstream media has a few narratives that they operate by, and one of them is sexism. And so since that is their political motivation, that's what sells, it gets the people who follow Oprah, the VTs, they're all going to, oh, God, look how oppressive and sad, and that sells. They act like they're protecting others. Mm -hmm. They're shielding themselves from ideas that they're afraid might be correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I try not to guess at other people's motivations, but examining their behavior, when they don't ever want to engage mm -hmm. or discuss, they just want to throw epithets. Yeah. To me, that signals that they're insecure. When she's wrong about video games, she just closes comments and says, I'm right. I saw her thesis, and it's like, you're not backing anything up. This is a very polemic biased view and you're not debating anybody on anything so what's the point you're just another talking head to me you're like glenn beck or someone i i think that a lot of people bring their own baggage mm -hmm. to when someone says i'm offended by x or i'm offended by y mm -hmm. that really says more about them they're they're be choosing to be offended again think about who majors in journalism you know, when you're 17, like, a lot, you know, the kid says, well, I'm become a chemical engineer or a doctor. Now, that's integrity. That's hard work. That's a kid that's been brought up right and wants to contribute to society. But I want to major in journalism. Why? And invariably they say, I want to change the world. That's, that's the opposite reason you should become a journalist. Your job is not to change the world. Your job is to report the truth and then have a cup of shut the fuck up. Uh, one of my articles got removed from a Magic the Gathering website that I contributed to. I'd contributed several articles to one of the top magic websites out there called Star City Games. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I had learned that the reason for this was that several anti-gamergate people, notably feminists, had been mass emailing Star City Games to get my review taken down because of a tweet I had written out several weeks earlier mm -hmm. where I had jokingly called one of my friends a name while I was playing a game with him. And the, I'd never heard of the person before yeah. who had um, started this campaign against me. I'd never interacted with them. Mm -hmm. But obviously, 
if you're digging through weeks of tweets that mm -hmm. someone had made, um, she was doing it on purpose. She, it's not just that she stumbled across something. And There's a tacky writer, Theodore Dalrymple, he says that uh, what society gets prudish about changes, but the level of prudery is always constant. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they started accepting you know, gender equality and f sexual fluidity, their tolerance for thinking differently mm -hmm. evaporated. Yeah. They're not, t if you don't think like them, they'll destroy you. Third wave feminism, progressivism, and social justice are just new monikers for a very old term. Marxism. Gaming is just the latest industry to be infiltrated and subverted by them. The underlying question is why? Why, if they have the superior culture, do they rely upon censorship and threats to push their agenda? Campus speech codes and violent protests. Why, if they are philosophically superior, must they rely upon barbaric techniques to achieve their goals? In his book, SJWs Always Lie, Theodore Beale boils down their behavior to three principles. One, they always lie. Two, they always project. And three, they always double down. We can trace this sort of behavior all the way back to Marx himself. As a child, he was anxious and domineering, never able to make friends. His own parents worried about his narcissism. As an adult, he was a lazy, spendthrift drunkard who allowed three of his own children to die rather than get a job, and whose poor parenting led two more into committing suicide. His economic theories were nothing of the sort. An economist studies reality and builds models to try and explain it. Marx projected his own meanness onto others and created a theory that would justify his own failures. Along with his sponsor Engels, a trust fund baby who resented his father's discipline and the textile empire which funded their activism, they blamed the capitalists for the very sins they manifested in their own lives, sloth, greed, and cowardice. That Marxism fails every time it's attempted doesn't matter. The hundred million dead from the past century don't matter. Marxism is not the philosophy of erudite winners, but that of envious losers. They would rather see others dragged down than attempt to build themselves up. Marx wanted to destroy the capitalists, not because he cared about the workers, but because their hard work and success made his own laziness all the more obvious. He was opposed to the nuclear family, and yes, gender feminism is not a recent development, but one of the founding principles of Marxism. Not because he truly believed that government daycares would do a better job raising children than their own parents, but because he was such a failure as a father, and he wanted others to suffer as he did. They always lie, they always project their own problems onto others, and no matter how obviously they fail, they always double down. Now, of course, this doesn't describe everyone who gathers under the big umbrella of Marxist, progressive, and social justice thought. For one thing, there are the useful idiots. Those who are promised the spoils of war if only they'll fight on behalf of their Marxist masters. When their usefulness is used up, they're sent back to the plantation. Then there are the psychopaths, the scheming manipulators who recognize the Marxists for the fools that they are, but see them as an opportunity to gain power. Lenin and Stalin, for instance. Lenin seemed to be a true believer. After the October Revolution, he pushed for the sort of social norms that America would later see in the 1970s. Along with his economic policies, this nearly brought Russia to the point of collapse by the mid-1920s. Stalin, meanwhile, bided his time until he could seize power and then revoked the worst of Lenin's policies. He wasn't interested in the ideology, he was interested in power. From its very inception, communism has been nothing more than the conceit of failed men projecting their own inadequacies onto the world. They seek out sex without taking on the responsibility of fatherhood. They desire luxury without hard work. They hold up the pretense of being scholars despite having no useful knowledge, and they promise their followers paradise tomorrow. It's always tomorrow. And then they ban religion because they say it does the same thing. Communism is nothing but solipsism, economic solipsism and cultural solipsism. It's been that way from the get-go. Communists don't create, they only critique. They don't build, they only tear down. 
And as for dismissing the hard work of game creators, artists, and programmers who manage to connect to an audience by claiming that their tropes are sexist, Marx would have immediately recognized Sarkeesian as a fellow traveler and convinced Engels to donate to her Patreon. One of the biggest problems that we have, especially amongst the female anti-porn activists, uh, and a lot of women in society, and this is part of the reason that the feminist narrative is so off right now, mm -hmm. most women, uh, per the Jungian archetypes, would go through the three phases of maiden mother crone. So yeah. the maiden archetype, and all women of every age have, an ex have this archetype existing within their subconscious psyche. But the first level maiden archetype is, is that of virginity and purity and, and joy. And you have the mother archetype. And when, once women mature into that, whether they have children or not, there's a perception of, of thinking of the other, thinking of other people, thinking of their well-being, thinking of, uh, of how our society and our communities are affected by our behavior. When you get into the crone, the crone is the highest level of that wisdom. It's how are my actions affecting society? How are the actions of others affecting society? Mm -hmm. Is it of the, for the good of all, or is this a personal need? Mm -hmm. Most women in, in current society are not graduating past their ma maiden archetype, and they're not given the tools to remedy their own shadow. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, right now, third wave feminism is the shadow of the maiden. It is mm -hmm. selfish, it is narcissistic, it is self-aggrandizing, mm -hmm. it is uh, infantile, yeah. which is exactly what we would expect from women who have never graduated yeah. past the maiden. These are women who literally are unable to see the world as being something that they're a part of. They want the world reflected back at them, yeah. like children. and. We see it in society. We have um, uh, stores named called Forever 21 yeah. that have clothing for 50-year-old women in them. Now, what does that say? It says in society, we are not growing up. From my personal experience and experiential life, yeah. if someone has a problem with women, usually had a bad mom yeah. or bad women in their lives. I had a bad mom, a bad mm. sister, bad nuns at school. Yeah. And I understand if a woman has a problem with guys, she might have had a bad father. You have to understand that the reason they're in academia is because they're lazy. Uh, there's no other way to put it. They're not, they don't want to work. They don't want real jobs. Uh, they're egotistical. They think labor, physical labor, hard work, real work is beneath them. And so they all, this is why journalism, uh, media, Nonprofits, government, and academia all have leftists because they're lazy. Th these are not real industries where you slave and toil and work hard. So what you invariably have when you have academia, I mean, I, I was a college teacher, you know, taught economics. It was an easy job. And all these teachers, teaching is the hardest. Like, fuck you. You've never had a real job in your life. You've, you've never shoveled shit like I did. You've never done physical labor. You never patrolled in fucking 30 below zero. We're dealing with privileged princesses mm -hmm. who've never faced real hardship. It is the princess and the pea syndrome. Yeah. What's the word, microaggressions? Yes. Thank, do microaggressions exist in sub-Saharan Africa? They've never worked a day in their goddamn life. And that's why you have this bias towards the left. Is It's not because... Uh, the left decides to go into academia, it's that no one in the real world would hire them because they're useless fucks. They have no value. They produce nothing of value to the real world. So you either go into a nonprofit that is charity, government, with his, which is forced charity, or academia, which is about 75% government finance, at least in the US, and you're not adhered to the real world. It's all theoretical. So that's why you have this bias to the left, and that's why they always end up in uh, academia. Modern people are very much out for themselves, and they don't mm -hmm. think about lineage or, or collaboration. Mm -hmm. If that was the case, then they would understand that we need to be also supporting our young men and our young mm -hmm. boys into science yeah. as a society. But yeah. they're focusing only on young girls, which right. is foolhardy. Mm -hmm. They hate traditionalism. Yeah. They see it as a cancer or a virus or as an evil. They don't think about mothers. See, because again, they're stuck in their maidenhood narrative. Yeah. So they don't think about the fact that a lot of women choose to exit the workforce because they choose to have children. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, all the evidence suggests equality is a lie. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, uh, because it's based on an emotional premise, that's why they become totalitarian and they become censors because they have to put out fires constantly or else the whole 
the jig is up. There's, yeah. I think I, the metaphor I used was like a sweater with this one little thread there. You pull on one thread, the whole sweater on. European feminism actually took that into account 40, 50 years ago, mm -hmm. but American feminism did not. It, it presupposed that most women wanted to go work outside of the house and did not want to have children. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing with the repercussions of that. Yeah. A lot of female engineers that I even worked with, mm -hmm. part of the reason that they made less than their male colleagues or weren't promoted as quickly is a lot of them took easier shifts and easier jobs and what have you because they wanted to be with their children at the mm -hmm. end of the day. They always talk about leveling the playing field. No, they're tilting it so the game ends in a tie. Yeah. Huge difference. And they can't, they can't discern between the two. Maybe they're dumb or maybe they're just blinded by emotion. Mm -hmm. Don't want to hang out with them long enough to find out. They will always trade safety for Like they want the safety and they will give up their liberty to do so. Mm -hmm. Why are these people, Marxists, social justice warriors, progressives, whatever you want to call them, so eager to kill the host they parasite off of? Western civilization, Christianity, the scientific method, due process, and the fundamental rights and freedoms of the individual? Why are they so eager to throw away the very protection that allows them to thrive? After all, these aren't the sort of people who could survive in the state of nature. They need Western civilization not the other way around. The answer is narcissism. Narcissism is a personality disorder characterized by grandiosity, feelings of entitlement, self-centeredness, and attention-seeking. But this doesn't begin to do it justice. It only describes the outside behavior, not the internal functioning, and by these criteria it's easy to mistake a perfectly moral and healthy egoist for a malignant narcissist. A lot of us are really smart. I'm really smart. Think for a moment of the difference between the persona you present to the world and the reality of who you truly know yourself to be. For most of us, these two parts of our personality are intimately related. Our persona isn't quite as grumpy, selfish, fearful, and mean as we know our inner selves to be. The persona is the idealized face we present to the world. But in attempting to be more cool and debonair than we actually are, we improve our inner self. And by improving ourself, we also improve our persona. Our persona is what we aspire to be, so we drive ourselves to become it. Now imagine what life would be like if these two aspects of yourself were completely divorced. What if there were no connection between your outward persona and your inner self? What sort of person would hide themselves so completely from others? A person who is nothing but a black hole of shame and hatred. The psychologist M. Scott Peck described them as people of the lie in his book of the same title. They project their own inner life onto everyone around them, assuming that everyone else is a phony just like them. That the reason you bought a nice car isn't because it makes you happy, but rather to rub in their faces that they cannot afford one. An act of love is when you sacrifice your own desires for the sake of another. A narcissist will sacrifice their own happiness and well-being for the sake of destroying yours. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven, cried Lucifer in Milton's Paradise Lost. The narcissist, the Marxist, the social justice warrior. These are people who'd rather see the rich suffer than themselves become successful. They would rather throw acid in a beautiful woman's face than do what they can to improve their own looks. They are willing to pay any price just to bring others down a peg and that is precisely what they are doing. The problem right now is we have a hijacked media narrative. There's a sensationalism and there's mm -hmm. also uh, an attempt to vilify the men in society who might actually speak up against their nouveau mm -hmm. leftist Marxist fascism, whatever the hell they're, cre they're creating. They're creating total control these lynch mobs who try to destroy your career and your life because mm -hmm. because all you do is think differently than them. Right. The, the views of your of this clique are like they're not we're not talking about they're, they're it's a 50-50 or a 64. You're talking that these social justice warriors are like 15% mm -hmm. of the population. Yeah. And that's being generous. Yeah, at best. Yeah. But they think that they're the majority mm -hmm. of it. And I don't I think I believe in free speech yeah. until these people think they're in a the majority and then they use what they think is this leverage mm -hmm. 
to try to punish people who don't share their views. Violent threats from feminists are nothing new whatsoever. There's Erin uh, Pitsy, the woman who founded the Battered Women's Shelter movement in England, was threatened and terrorized the moment she started talking about violent women. Um, Richard Gells, the world's foremost authority on, on gender violence, on intimate partner violence rather, published a report of indicating gender symmetry and bomb threats were phoned into conferences he was scheduled to speak at. The same thing happened to Suzanne Steinmetz and Murray Strauss, two other leading researchers who concluded, because the evidence is there, that there is gender symmetry in intimate partner violence, and they were all threatened. This is, and this goes all the way back to the suffragette movements with them burning down facilities and plotting to murder people. The history of feminist violence is there. People have to look for it a little bit because the media is not so hot on covering it. But if you do your research, you'll find plenty of it. They've lost their humanity. They don't know what it is to be human. They don't understand the value of life. So they consider some mean words to be the same as actually living in a war zone. It's a completely yeah. different thing and it shows their lack of perspective mm -hmm. the outside world. Additionally, quite frankly, the United States is one of the last places yeah. that has the ability to speak freely. And if we give that up over some mean tweets, yeah. we'll be into the world. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. We're, we're the last, I mean, we, we've seen this, we've seen that petitions have created censorship in other countries. Petitions online. Mm -hmm. Nameless, faceless people signing a petition is enough to generate censorship. That's a right. big problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that as we see this, yeah. and I hate to be so alarmist, but it's, it, to me it seems to, to be the modern equivalent of falling back into a dark ages. Mm -hmm. When people are afraid to critique somebody, I mean, mm -hmm. most of Anita Sarkeesian's supposed harassment is nothing more than critiques of her work. Yeah, yeah. These people won't seem to rest until every fire is stamped out. Mm -hmm and everyone who thinks differently is either dead or thinking like they are. Since the filming of this documentary, Sarkeesian has moved on from video games. Her Tropes vs. Women series made 25 times what it initially asked for. She leveraged her videos into becoming a talking head on CNN. She became a paid shill for Intel, a speaker at the UN, and now is on Twitter's Trust and Safety Council, censoring speech on that platform. So which is she? A useful idiot? A true believer? Or a sociopath? In the end, it doesn't matter. She is just another cog in the machine of tyranny. And the fight against tyranny starts with all of us. What does Gamergate even have to do with Anita Sarkeesian in the first place, other than the fact that her videos are getting coverage that yeah. they don't really merit? Anita Sarkeesian hijacked this. This had nothing to do with her right. whatsoever. Um, so she hijacked it and because she wanted to be a part of this, this narrative that male gamers, who she's been fighting against the last two years, and it's been a big money-making thing mm. for her. We're not going to really talk about the video games so much. We're not going to talk too much about the criticisms of video games. We're going to talk mostly about the cyber mob and and you know, how victimized you are. The story is that it's a story. It should just go away. It really should. But, as is the case of Gamergate, Gamergate is, you know, uh, shining a light into just what a political bias, what fucking bullshit, and how it, 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 it's, it's, uh, that's what Gamergate is about. It's like, look, the corruption is the coverage. All of that bullshit. Right, that's what she's really made a, a career of, and I was thinking originally that it would be a secondary career, but now I think it's her primary career. They want to make sure that Anita is portrayed in a good light so that it kind of portrays feminism in a good light, because if she's discredited, I think they believe that feminism itself will be discredited. Uh, a lot of people may not know this, but feminism itself is a multi-billion dollar industry. When you come out, count domestic violence and, and rape advocacy and uh, what's happened in, in psychotherapy, which I'm very familiar with, with the dominance of feminist ideology, even in clinical practice, it is a multi-billion dollar industry and there's a narrative of patriarchy theory attached to it 
and that is why it has to be. There's this assumption in feminist ideology that all men benefit as the result of patriarchy. Well, mm -hmm. really historically, it's yeah. always been a very tiny group of patriarchs and poor men, it's really yeah. socioeconomics. I mean, mm -hmm. to break it down into anything else is foolhardy. And social justice warriors have, have sucked that up and they moved right into the gaming industry with it. And now it's finally costing them. People who join social justice movements hate themselves individually. Mm. and want to just erase that and obscure their own identity by blending into this sea of people. And they feel safe within this ocean or this mass movement. Yeah. And that's why I find typically the more socially oriented someone is, the less of an individual they are. Anita Sarkeesian could be anyone. Mm -hmm. it, they, the, Anita Sarkeesian was invented by these activist freelancers, mm -hmm. in effect is that if it wasn't her, there's a zillion other people just like her out there. Yeah. They just they picked her to so that they could get out their message. Mm -hmm. And and the proof of that, she was willing to be a prop for Intel. Yeah. Right? To put a stamp on their on their initiative to have more diversity, which hey, I, I think is great. Yeah. Um, but as far as I know, her her videos are not about uh, workforce diversity. They're about complaints about tropes. Has nothing to do with the workforce, but hey, if she can get paid, she'll do it. Yeah. So she's a willing pro um, prop for that sort of thing. Okay. I think that's, if it not her, it would have been someone else. But really think about these people and if that's the life you want to live. Like, do you want to become a social justice warrior? Where you live in a delusional world, you hate life, you're too lazy to work at anything, and your sole purpose in life is to live off of other people. Is that the life you want? Because it's gonna be miserable. It's gonna be fucking miserable. And all you have to do is look, I mean, how many of these people like, well, was it Zoe Quinn? But I, I read through several of the profiles. They all have mental problems. Like there's, it's on their, their uh, wiki page or whatever else. Like they have to have treatment and they went through depression and da da da. These are not people you want to envy. <laughs> these are not people you want to become. These are the losers of society. These are women who want to be victims because they see that it's profitable. Yeah, yeah. Advertisers are abandoning uh, them for the corruption, the journalistic corruption in the gaming industry is well documented now. It's out there for everybody to see. None of them have set foot, none of them are programmers. None of them actually make a freaking game. And if they do, it's, it's dipshitsville. I mean, it's, it's what, was, what was Depression uh -huh. Quest? Fuck me with a spoon backwards. What the hell is that? They made a miscalculation when they defined their enemy. They saw their enemy as being white male gamers. What they didn't understand and they didn't anticipate is that gamers are a very large, very diverse group of people. Male, female, every ethnic minority under the sun, multiple countries. So they thought, well, we're gonna fight our enemy and our enemy is white male patriarchy and video gamers. They hadn't kept up with the times. They actually didn't understand their own demographics. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of females in video games. You have a lot of ethnic minorities in female games and both. And you'll notice that in the Gamergate crowd, there's more uh, diversity than in the anti-gamer group. Gate crowd. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is that these are people who said you're attacking our hobby and you're telling us that we're somebody that we're not. These people are so used to being in a hug box yeah. that when they get pushed back, they just collapse. They disintegrate. As I pass through my incarnations, in every age and race, I make my proper prostration to the gods of the marketplace. Peering through reverent fingers, I watch them flourish and fall, and the gods of the copybook headings, I notice, outlast them all. We were living in trees when they met us. They showed us, each in turn, that water would certainly wet us, as fire would certainly burn. But we found them lacking in uplift, vision, and breadth of mind. So we left them to teach the gorillas while we followed the march of mankind. We moved as the spirit listed. They never altered their pace, being neither cloud nor wind-borne like the gods of the marketplace. But they always caught up with our progress, and presently word would come that a tribe had been wiped off its ice field or the lights had gone out in Rome. With the hopes that our world is built on, 
they were utterly out of touch. They denied the moon was Stilton. They denied she was even Dutch. They denied that wishes were horses. They denied that a pig had wings. So we worshipped the gods of the market who promised these beautiful things. When the Cambrian measures were forming, they promised perpetual peace. They swore if we gave them our weapons that the wars of the tribes would cease. But when we disarmed, they sold us and delivered us bound to our foe. And the gods of the copybook heading said, Stick to the devil you know. On the first Feminian sandstones, we were promised the fuller life, which started by loving our neighbor and ended by loving his wife. Till our women had no more children and the men lost reason and faith. And the gods of the copybook heading said, The wages of sin is death. In the Carboniferous Epoch, we were promised abundance for all, by robbing selected Peter, to pay for collective Paul. But though we had plenty of money, there was nothing our money could buy. And the gods of the copybook heading said, If you don't work, you die. Then the gods of the market tumbled, and their smooth-tongued wizards withdrew. And the hearts of the meanest were humbled, and began to believe it was true, that all is not gold that glitters, and two and two make four. And the gods of the copybook headings limped up to explain it once more. As it will be in the future, it was at the birth of man. There are only four things certain since social progress began. That the dog returns to his vomit, and the sow returns to her mire and the burnt fool's bandaged finger goes wobbling back to the fire. And that after this is accomplished, and the brave new world begins, when all men are paid for existing, and no man must pay for his sins, as surely as water will wet us, as surely as fire will burn, the gods of the copybook headings, with terror and slaughter, return.